Welcome to On Open Source. Conversations with thought leaders in the open source community. Brought to you by So even why don't you give us a little bit of background about who you are, what you do, and uh, what keeps you busy from a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. I mean, what I'm basically I am uh, the combination of three things: a hacker, a legal historian, and a lawyer working in a sort of practical day-to-day -day way to make things happen using words. Okay. Uh, the part of it that's the hacker part started when I was twelve and lasted until they take the last thing I can program away from me in the end. they your keyboard out right? of your exactly. cold, dead fingers. Right. I was, I was one of the compulsive programmers that Joseph Wiedenbaum might have been writing about in the computer power and human reason back when mainframes were what compulsive people tried to program. Okay. Uh, and in that sense, like Stallman, like John Gilmore, like others in our generation, I grew up in a world of much freer code than the world of the Microsoft era. We right. may not have worked for companies that in some fundamental GPL-like sense were involved in sharing, but they had to be involved in sharing. IBM didn't sell mainframes to people who couldn't read the code. I and mean, that was a right. ludicrous idea. Right. And without capturing user innovation, without returning what users knew about what was wrong and what could be right, uh, nobody could have worked. When I worked for IBM between 1979 and 1984, I spent a lot of time working on the APL interpreter that IBM used to run the APL language, which then was the most popular programming language in Europe. It would have been absurd to think of me maintaining that interpreter without a constant stream of suggestions, including patches down to lines of 370 assembler code submitted mm -hmm. by people who used the program and who needed to have their fixes in or their itches scratched. Right. The primary right. difference was that there was no internet. There right. was no form of decentralized software distribution. So everything came back through manufacturers who shared with users the opportunity to improve products that sold hardware. That was the software business before Microsoft. Right. And one right. of the things that generated the sort of free software commitment in my generation was that we had grown up in a place that was a lot closer to where we were trying to get than right. the world we were living in now. And right. when you know that you've been halfway there already, so you know how to get back that far, Right. And you understand why that was so much better than where you are now. That gives you a particularly strong spirit for finishing the trip and going the whole distance. And I think that's what made the generation of people like Stallman, like me, particularly hard to compromise with when it came to what the real objective was. We know we have been almost all the way to the promised land. Now we have to find a way to get the rest of the time through. So maybe that was the technical environment I grew up in. Okay. Um, uh, in the early 1980s, uh, that didn't seem to be the technical future. The technical future seemed to belong uh, to point and grunt interfaces and a very locked down uh, kind of world. I went and I did a PhD in history. I got a law degree. I did legal history. I did other things. Mm -hmm. I thought about information flows in relation to the way people govern themselves. And I thought about those as an academic lawyer, and okay. I did some legal work. Over the course of the 90s, I drifted back to doing free software law. Uh, I suppose I can't say I drifted back to it. I suppose I have to say I drifted back to inventing it with Stallman, right. because when I started working for him in 1993, there weren't any legal institutions except the GPL. Right. There was no plan of enforcement. There was no interactive structure with the universe. There was the GPL he had made and the question now, how do we make this actually work? Right. And I've spent a lot of time asking that question, not just about the GPL, but also about other licenses. And beginning in 2004, I made the Software Freedom Law Center, okay. which is the first nonprofit legal services organization in the world, totally specialized in helping people who make and distribute free and open source software. What we do is we find the resources necessary to pay lawyers to help people at no cost who make and distribute free software. 
because mm -hmm. those hackers are not going to be able to pay the best lawyers in the world. Right. We have right. to find a way to see it to it that the best lawyers in the world, that the specialties they need, are available to them at the price they can afford to pay, which is zero. Now, you mentioned you know all the licenses, and obviously today we have hundreds of thousands, it seems, different license models for software. GPL, the Apache license, the MIT license, the BSD license. You know, Microsoft has one, the shared source license. As a open source developer, as I'm looking at, you know, trying to release a particular project, I read these licenses and, you know, it reads legalese. I mean, this is, this is not something that I'm particularly comfortable with understanding and so forth. Is there, is there some easy distinction between all these different license models? Well, you can ask yourself a couple of really basic questions about what you want the fate of your code to be. Mm -hmm. You can say, first of all, um, if it's all your code, if you in this is a single individual programmer or a collection of people who've all agreed to make a decision together, then it's a free decision and it's up to you. Now mm -hmm. you want to ask what you think about the future of your code. Okay. If you would like your code to be freely available for people to do anything they want with, including make proprietary, okay. then there are a list of licenses to think about which are permissive licenses. They permit people to take your code, which is free when they get it, mm -hmm. free to copy, free to modify, free to redistribute, and allows them to put it in code that isn't free to modify, redistribute, and copy. Okay. They can close their versions of it. Okay. If you want people to be able to close their versions of your code, then the BSD license, the Apache license, uh, and the MIT X11 license are basically versions of the you can do anything you want with this. Okay. In increasing order of complexity from the MIT X11 license, which is the most minimalist thing there is, okay. just here take this, do what you want with it, Okay. to the BSD licenses which say, here, take this, do what you want with it, but keep my attribution information about the copyright present, okay. to the Apache license, which contains some real stiffening about the relation of people to the project because the Apache Foundation's members who make the Apache software license are trying to permit the broadest possible use of the code flexibly, including proprietary uses of the code, but mm -hmm. they're also trying to protect the integrity of the Apache project. Right. So they use a little more legal stiffening to make a permissive license which nonetheless protects the integrity of the, process, of the project that emits the standard reference version of the code. Okay. So you could say that those are three simple permissive licenses. You use them if you want to allow your code to be proprietary. They have an increasing order of complexity depending on how much you want to be responsible for seeing to it that people keep your notices in your code mm -hmm. and that people protect the integrity of your project in certain valuable legal ways. They're all three good licenses. The MIT X11 license is what I guess I would characterize as hardly a license. The very minimal thing you can do and still be a copyright sort holder. Sort of the license that's not a license. It's the license that says I give up as much as copyright gives me, mm -hmm. basically. But copyright gave it to me and I'm handing it on to you. So I'm maintaining my status as a copyright holder. But that's all I'm doing. Okay. I'm, I'm giving away pretty much everything. Now, the other way you might have answered that basic root question, do I want to permit the proprietizing of my code, might have been no. Mm -hmm. I want this project to be born free now and to stay free forever. That is, I want only free software versions of this program to exist. And anybody who makes anything out of this program should also make free software versions only. Okay. If that's how you feel about the code, then the GPL is probably the right answer. And it's a species of copyleft license, that okay. is, license that has that property of born free and free forever, but it is also the most widely used and the most widely understood of those licenses.
For more information, visit onpodcastweekly.com and subscribe to all our podcasts. Brought to you by the publishing imprints and information portal of Pearson Education. Be sure to download next week's episode, part two of this series.